Welcome everyone and thank you for attending our webinar, Strategic Approaches to Data Management and ITOT Convergence. My name is Tom Trapel and I will be your moderator. Today our featured guests are Remy Glasner, Research Director for ITOT Convergence Strategies at IDC, and David Thomason, Power Generation Industry Principal at OSISOF. Today's webinar will take roughly 45 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. But before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping notes. First, this webinar is being recorded, and we will be providing the recording and slides after the webinar. You can expect an email with the recording following the conclusion of this event. Uh, we will also be conducting a poll during the hour to better understand your recent experience with ITOT convergence. Your participation is highly appreciated. And finally, you'll notice to the right um, of the WebEx digital event platform under our participants, the Q&A option. I want to encourage everyone to submit any questions you may have for Remy or David through this feature. And if we're not able to get to everyone's question, we will certainly follow up with a response afterward. And with that, I will now hand it off to Remy Glasner to get started with our discussion today. But gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Remy, take it away. Okay, sorry. So um, the idea for today is to share with you a couple of perspectives and observations um, and then my intent is to suggest also a couple of simple models and frameworks uh, that I trust you could use like tools to make decisions for your organization, keep the pace and thrive within what we now call the uh, intelligence operation era. So talking of decision makers, um, you know, they, at all levels these days, decision makers want to ask new questions. They, they want to have instant access to actionable information anywhere and without having to worry or wait for data preparation then. Yet, um, so very few senior executives, just a little over 25 percent in um, what we call operation intensive organizations, so those in manufacturing, logistics, ener energy, power, pharma, transport, etc., they, they completely agree that their IT group's response to is satisfying when it comes to requests for an analytics or BI. So, said simply, um, the IT group doesn't meet expectations and is getting painful. In the meantime, uh, we got about 90% of users um, that that view data analytics as competitive advantage or differentiator. And this is why a whooping 65% of these organizations, they told us that they started to use and keep track of new KPI. However, we also got something like about 24% of executives who believe they have been able to extract the maximum value from the data at hand. Data, well, you know, now all organizations have data, plenty of data, too many data sometimes. So the, the trick is to have data and also to generate a variety of accurate and actionable perspectives that are usable by many users. The point is to know continuity between all beneficiaries and users of the data and of its associated value. So data is integral, integral to the enterprise digital transformation, right? The um, DX concept, as we call it, for digital transformation, I see called that DX, it's been around for quite a quite some time now. Um, it has already changed a lot of expectations and created a lot of interrogations well beyond the historical technology science. So, so without digging into too many details of all the roles and functions that you see on that slide, um, I think it is important to note that all have a very strong sense of the necessity to adapt the, net, the nature of the enterprise, business, and operating model. Most uh, also have a great sense of urgency for the situation. And, and quite frankly, uh, none of them is completely wrong, yet none of them can truly pretend owning or leading the digital transformation. By the way, it doesn't mean that all functions and levels should feel empowered to make all sort of technology decisions. That, that's not the point at all. But it means that expectations are being set at a higher and higher level when it comes to the leveraging of digital technologies cannot have an enablement tool for a variety of business cases. And that includes also people who are non-technologists. So in, the, in this generic view, my perspective is that actually at the CFO office, that is likely to have the most comprehensive reasoning as of right now. And, and this is so because bundles both a vision for switching optimization for innovation that comes actually from the CIO office 
and the underlying need for discipline and resilience that is well understood and applied by the operation leadership. So as you can, as you can certainly guess, this perspective is driven by field observations, but IDC also regularly conducts uh, broad surveys to precisely capture a situation in context. So with that said, about a year ago, um, we, you know, we, we run that survey, we call it IT integration. It was mostly done, most respondents were in IT, but we had a couple of people outside of IT, in OT and other business function. And when looking at all the issue and top barriers for uh, IT OT integration, back like almost a year ago, um, the big one was, you know, security. Security was at the top. The need for IT and OT system in terms of security are quite diverse and can you know, complicate the integration requirements. Uh, another issue within the integrated system and the varying technologies and compatibility of IT and OT applications, and particularly the legacy application, was mentioned as you know a big um, top concern, big barrier for IT OT integration. By the way, I call what I call legacy. Um, I'm so many of you understand that legacy in the OT world, uh, you probably count that in decade, whereas in IT, it's probably just a year or two and the system is already too old. Um, obviously, we've got governance and organizational related challenge uh, popping up at the top, but um, just, just noted that technology leaders, um, they consider that they, they have their hands full with business cases. Uh, they put that at the, at the complete bottom. Um, I, I would argue sometime, and we'll talk about that later, that uh, a business case is not a use case, and you got to be careful about not mixing up the two. So, talking now about the uh, reality of the connected operational assets, um, the same survey uh, indicated that the rapid pace of adoption for connected operational assets um, was, was really ongoing. So, we got now about 60% of operational equip equipment that were, I mean, sorry. In 2016, 60% of those equipments were considered connected, and our data were indicating that only a little over 20% of all those operational equipment were non-connected as of, as of last year. So clearly, the operations realm um, is getting into the digital tsunami, and, the, and by the way, that means the creation of many, many, many new operational data. So as operational assets get connected, they become part of the, uh, the digital-ready OT stack, if you like, which in turn becomes what I will refer to as the traditional uh, digitized OT application stack. And here, the idea is to take a kind of a simplified look at what the digitized OT stack looks like, right? So we start at the bottom with the uh, OT assets and devices. And this model is generic by, by the way, um, in the sense that you can apply that to any sort of OT or connected device, uh, turbine, a sensor, physical device basically that captures and shares um, also digitized info about the physical state. So now, one level up, um, we got the middleware stack. This layer takes care of data ingestion, processing, and integration. So put simply, the key function of the middleware stack is to help make application development simpler. OT application in that case, obviously. So for example, this is done um, by offering common programming abstraction. So this layer, it enables um, homogeneity of data. Now one level up, you go to data management, and there um, it, it is meant to transform data originally from the bottom OT asset, right? And then aggregate it, but also with other data, either from the same source, so the OT asset, but also from other OT assets, or IT system, or third-party system. So now, um, you have a more homogeneous, more and more standardized data that comes from a variety of places and that are talking the same code, if you like. And at the top, finally, you got all the analytics layers, so it's dashboard, other visual reporting, monitoring tools, and such dashboards, um, they can be customized to serve the many purposes that they're intended to, um, that can be, you know, at the local level or field level, as well as, you know, operation executive level. And this could be like data to be added to a financial report as much as scenario planning for, um, you know, maintenance of a, of a device. 
Um, so with all that said, I think it's pretty clear how creating this stack, and, and again, this is a re relatively simplified view of the world, can create a much more nimble OT application and, and serve the operation. But if you take a step back now, um, I never mentioned, or maybe just one, the word IT. And basically, they're not named, and I did that personally. Um, they could be, and they are involved many times, in many cases, in those um, OT application stack. But quite frankly, if you're an OT leader, you don't really have to do it. And this is actually a danger here. Um, you actually create a potentially stronger sign, so you don't want to do that. And why does it matter so much to bundle, bundle IT and OT? Because uh, digitizing an operational asset doesn't make for digital transformation, and it doesn't make for IT OT convergence either, by the way. If you only create OT application to create a nicer looking dashboard um, that is just simpler to be sent by email, you are completely missing the point of the digital transformation at enterprise level. So ultimately, um, digital transformation at the enterprise level means creating a renewed value proposition that is supported by many different types of data coming from many different operational, virtual, physical environments. All these data, data come from uh, within the enterprise, but also, as I said, from also from a complex third-party ecosystem. So all that view of ITOT being siloed, potentially even more siloed because of digital technology. Um, this is something we hear. I don't know why that's okay. Something that we hear. So let's let's um let's take a step back for a minute and think about you know, all these uh, digital projects on the OT side of the world. So common challenge that we see and observe uh, at the local level is the scalability of such projects, right? So I'd like to suggest that model. Um, where basically you got three levels. First one is tactical. You add digital capability to a system, it belongs to the local level, and the goal is to achieve a higher level of efficiency. So typically, you want to reduce cost, uh, downtime, you want to plan better, and on the planning side, on the technology side, you know, it includes all the usual digital enablers, such as you know, IoT, analytics, um, and even you know, the latest digital technology, if you like. The point here is they are used either um, in isolation or like in very small numbers, so you remain completely local. And you also got a second level when you think about uh, repositioning your um, digital initiative. And here we're talking about ITOT convergence. ITOT convergence as um, a strategy for the enterprise. It is operation performance management across the organization that you're trying to do, and you want to deliver uh, ultimately predictability to the business, right? Technology deployed, um, they are kind of similar to the one for the tactical level. The only real difference here is they are streamlined in terms of connectivity and interconnectivity, right? So basically you start with all those connections, you move from just looking at assets, connected assets, and you move that and you switch that to a data-centric environment. Now there's a third level um, that I would like to talk to you about. And I call that OX, stands for um, Operationally Intelligent Organization, right? And here, this is the ultimate goal of the, digital, the full digital enterprise transformation. Um, this is where you move from trying to do something all better, so you improve process, the workflow or something, to actually you empower innovation and you completely change the user supply chain operating. So said differently, you create new capabilities, new value derivated from the digitally driven operational transformation. And this is not transparent anymore for the user, for the customer, and for your ecosystem. In terms of technology now, um, difficult to talk about technology, could, could be a little futuristic, but I want to introduce you to that model. Um, IDC call that the software defined automation model. Um, let me explain where I come from here. This model represents the entirety of an operational environment that's on the right hand side. And it's basically theory of objects, right, that are evolving over three dimensions. One is the volume, volume or range, so we call that ecosystem services. The point here is to scale up and down fast, to remove or add objects temporarily, permanently, doesn't matter. And those objects represent assets, partners, locations, 
and even entire segments of the business ecosystem, if you like. Second dimension is space. Point here is to go from micro to micro. Zoom in, zoom out at an object, at a process, at a partner, at an ecosystem level, to get the perspective and value that matter in context, right? And the third level is time. We call that critical intelligence. It's play, rewind, predict. Full leveraging of real-time digital trends and analytics. And analytics, that's what you do, do there. So within the SDA model, objects can be projected individually or the sum of multiple and differentiated units. So as operational assets integrate the digital world, there's an underlying need, need to modernize the way the operational and automation technology stack is structured. Why? Because the, the manipulation of data generated by these assets is actually mimicking the exact same pyramidal stack. It is sensor-based data that top the pyramid, or real-time data, or ERP data, or EAM data, or APM data, you name it. The point is, um, there is no more one straightforward answer to that. Which data come first, come at the top or, come, or stay at the bottom? It depends on who you are within the organization and the business ecosystem. It also depends on what information you need to get and when you need to get them. Overall, it's which vision of the environment you need at a point in time and according to a specific context. So this is where those elements are the core of the operationally intelligent organization. And to translate the theory into practice, let me move on to our next slide. This is um, all the use cases that IDCC uh, for the digital transformation of the energy and utility sector. So the way it works here is we work by Horizon. Horizon 1, it's of those um, use cases that we are expecting organization embracing the digital transformation to execute now. Um, for example, um, that could be uh, the vir virtual power plants as an instrumentation. And the way those polygons are interconnected together um, it's actually purposely done. So between the virtual power plants and green in the middle and the asset instrumentation, there's an obvious link between the two. So this line is a little dense and I cannot go through all the use cases, but this presentation, as we uh, were saying, will be shared with you soon after and you will have um, plenty of time to look at um, all the use cases and what we see at Horizon 2 and Horizon 3. Uh, with that said, um, I'd like to move on to actually the next slide and provide a couple of quick guidances, um, nothing so crazy uh, for um, people we call now the digital OT leaders and actually for OT professional um, as a whole. So first guidance we have for you is um, you, you have to link your OT strategy to a core digital element. So application, OT application are moving to the line of business. So it's important that you align yourself with IT supporting the infrastructure for innovation. Second, you, you've got to be the solution of the enterprise IT roadmap, not just the part of it. So don't wait for other people working on in OT in other segments of the business or IT to come to your head to do that. Move forward. Um, you also got to foster essential digital infrastructure within your OT spending plan. It's important. We were talking about Horizon right before. Horizon means you got to plan ahead. Um, going digital, it's not free. There's a lot of um, different spending that you will have to assess and come forward with. So we really believe that planning the financial aspect of your digital transformation beyond simple ROI where it's about uh, reducing costs and everything is really important. Obviously, um, probably should have started with this one, but I like it in the middle, um, safety of the uh, growing enterprise-wide digital world. So, it's, you know, technology leaders are looking for agile security that works across all innovation platforms. Um, OT is as much, if not more, at risk than IT when it comes to cybersecurity. And OT leaders, even if as of right now, don't necessarily feel all the pressure when it comes to security, if something goes wrong, um, don't wait too long to get along with like the latest uh, cybersecurity practices um, of the IT and IT world. Then, of course, articulate a message, um, I call that digestible uh, by the executive leadership. So here, executive leadership, I mean, 
people that are not technology people, people at the executive level. Um, try to avoid those three letters uh, acronyms all the time. Try to make it simple. Try to make it in, uh, a message in such a way that people stop considering you as just a cost center that is doing something with technology, but really as people who are here to enable innovation, enable uh, attacking new markets, new clients, uh, creating new products, on and on. And finally, basically, it links to the same point, shift from being the point of activity. Uh, operation, it's the place of innovation. It must be one of the places of innovation in the enterprise. All right, and with all that said, um, the ITOT convergence topic in the context of a broad uh, digital transformation is incredibly vast. So please uh, share any of your, any question you may have right now through the WebEx platform. And um, I will now pass it on back to you, David. Thank you, Remy. Before we begin um, with our next segment, uh, we'd like to take a quick poll of the audience. We're wondering, what is the biggest barrier to moving toward an ITOT data strategy for your company? Are you not sure where to start? Is there a lack of funding? Is it unclear ROI? Is it hard to acquire executive approval? Or is it something else? And I will open the poll at this moment. Please feel free to submit your, quest, your, your response at any time. And while we're waiting for the responses to come in, Remy, David, what have you seen for companies most recently has been the biggest barrier to building an ITOT data strategy? Well, uh, Tom, I, I think the most thing that I see is, is uh, more of a lack of understanding of the risk associated with the OT side from the IT side. Uh, many companies try to approach the OT side with the same common practices they would use on their IT systems. And there's, of course, those need to be modified when you're looking at trying to incorporate not only the management of OT systems, but in getting the information and such from those systems. So I think uh, an understanding and, and, and to know that there's different ways of doing those systems really helps the companies that are successful. They have a CIO that recognizes that, that begins to understand it, and kind of has an IT OT group that has that expertise in, in their organization their organization right and uh, i will i will fully agree with uh with david on that and i will also add that um what one thing that i uh, and told the time is the it and ot group um should realize how the other group how smart the other group is and now they understand the world in a different way but they understand very well ot people get digital it people get digital just maybe a, from a different perspective, but it's uh, really a communication, um, understanding that, as David said, that models don't necessarily apply, but can be modified to actually apply, that's important. So communication between the two groups is uh, probably one of the barrier right now. Thank you, gentlemen. And we are closing the poll right now. And it appears about a third of our participants um, said unclear ROI, we're about 25% said that we're not sure where to start. So thank you very much for your participation in the poll. And with that, I will now pass it off to David Thomason. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for attending today. Remy, thank you for your presentation. It was ex excellent, and Tom for the introduction. Uh, really want to talk uh, some more about the topics that have been discussed before, but also talk about how this is actually being applied uh, and how value analytics are being used within the industry. First, the opportunity in OT data is huge, but there's also a big challenge around that. Uh, the data is not in a structured form. It, it comes from all kind of different devices and source, source, sources. You also want to integrate that data with other information. But being able to take that information and that data and make it an asset that everyone can use from your process engineers, production managers, get it to your data scientist teams, uh, if you have that type of organization, uh, still being able to be le le leveraged, of course, by analysts and, and maintenance folks as well. And that's why here at OSISOF, we enable what we call a data infrastructure from the collection all the way to, uh, to the display and analytics. But being able to provide situation awareness, uh, information in real time, uh, and, and 
than being able to have tools that not only display that information, but are really designed as a tool to allow a user to interact with that information. Uh, our guys have done an amazing job of creating a, pro a pro product that allows you to manipulate and use and mine information from real-time events, other data that's been correlated with that, and also uh, with information that then they can customize, kind of a self-service operational technology BI. Then, of course, the data needs to be, you know, groomed up to be able to be fit into third-party app applications, things that are fit for purpose. So we're really talking about pervasive connectivity across multiple vendors and IIoT type devices, becoming a system of record for your OT information, being operations ready for everybody to use across the organization, being able to make these decisions in real or near real time, and being that bridge for integrating IT and OT to support these types of initiatives. Now, when we look at OT data, it's normally uh, more sporadic. It's not in rows and columns like everything. It's usually real-time information. And to be able to bring that data into a way that is, nor is normalized and being able to be managed really helps other systems. We kind of like to use the analogy of how there's a chart of accounts in, in financial systems. Uh, Pi Asset Framework is a meta layer that we use to take that sporadic, diverse OT information and put it into context of your organization, of your assets, to be better utilized. The other big information uh, gap between uh, OT and IT is the criticality of that information. The critical systems that that data comes from is highly protected, and it should be extremely protected. So inside an electronic security parameter, this is how people used to have to get that information. So the more people you had inside the ESP or accessing inside the electronic security perimeter, the more risk and problems you actually can occur. The idea is to get that information out of there, get it in real time, and provide that in a passive nature to a wider audience. At the same time, you're now expanding the usage of the system and the information, but you're limiting and reducing risk of people accessing into those critical systems. I'd like to talk a little bit about a layered approach to analytics. Last few years, of course, there's big, a lot of IT hype cycle around big data analytics, AI and machine learning. There's a lot of big value in that, and that's really a direction that a lot of companies are headed. But sometimes it's not the right tool of choice. Um, there's particular use cases for that and particular use cases for where is the best place for the analytic to happen and when do you need that analytic to run. Right now, what we're looking at is a, is a band that's showing really the stream, the real-time streaming, the collection of that in event time data in context, and being able to do mathematics in that in real time. Let's call that a level one predictive analytics, and there's huge value, especially in power and utilities, in this area. Now, we elevate this idea up into other layers of analytics. Uh, being a tactical machine learning or AI approach, this would be looking at equipment or system level, finding out what type of analytic works best for that and the type of system, and going at those pieces of equipment. Turning that tactical approach into strategic is like, oh, now that I've done that, I can apply that to multiple sites, entire plants, uh, sites all over the globe. And then being up to a community level is more like an independent system operator or others big companies might use to where you're actually tying that information into your overall supply chain or other all folks that need to utilize your information. Now, that doesn't mean that this upper level is a big data system. There's many, many approaches to attack this other ways. We see a lot of value in this tactical machine learning approach by using advanced pattern recognition products, by doing uh, uh, analytics where you're tying it to libraries and but then we also see some use cases that are very good up, up in the big data systems to where you take that OT data and get it prepared to be correlated with other corporate data, maybe like your trade floor data, your gas positions, your power positions, whatever those may be. But now you can correlate those positions directly with how your assets are actually operating and do analysis deeper, wider, and more often 
than what used to be able in, in the past. We also see the ability of being pushing analytics down towards the edge. This is up and coming, people are doing it, and you'll be able to see soon, I believe, that similar to, to, to your car, maybe the next big pump you buy or the next big wind turbine you buy actually has analytics running on, on the devices themselves. You will still want to collect those and bring those up into a system so you can correlate those with the rest of the assets and within the corporation. Now, what we do when we want to take our information and move it from an OT type of format into a analytics packages or visuals is be able to what we call cast. So you can be able to take that OT data, cleanse it, augment it, shape it, and transmit it. This kind of addresses the data quality issue, aggregation data, creating models, and normalizing that information. Our data integrators do this with OT data and can feed that information into many of the common visual analytics tools, big data systems, and also to feed them into statistical analysis. So let's talk really about what this kind of OT structure is. Being able to collect many sources of raw data and information, taking that information uh, in its variety and being able to structure it and put context and do that via an approach with templates. This is also a place where we, we're going to do abstraction. We can bring data in from a window in from your ERP system. You can bring in specifications, limits, all these other uh, like fault codes and such, which may come from your equipment manufacturers, and be able to now have this consolidated in an area where the streaming analytics capability can really provide some extra value. Now, once you have a set of structured data, you still have access to the raw data always, but now it's in a structure. You can then now transform that information in real time and create event frames, which are bookmarks into the system to really identify other types of information to change the raw data into better information for yourself. So if you want to take you know, a, a, and count how many times a pump has started and stopped, how long has it been in service? By putting event frame markers in there, that information is readily available and easily mined from the database. You can do simple calculations like rate of change, differential pressure across filters. These easy calculations can be done and rewritten right back into the system and trended like if it was real-time information. You can compare actual versus design. We can do a bunch of different type of event frame analyses. We can do efficiencies, and all of these types of things can then be used to as notifications. So I can be sitting here with my cell phone today, getting a high vibration out of a wind turbine, and then out of that email, I just click on it, and I am, it takes me directly to viewing the source of the problem and the source of the information that sent me the notification. And now that I have this raw data in a structure, I've transformed and created new data from it that's more important to, to me, then I now can feed this to this layer two analytic level, which may be advanced pattern recognition, machine learning algorithms. You know, we have hooks into MATLAB, R, and Python, or being able to put it into a big data platform. So you can use things like Tableau and Tipco Spotfire. Now, it isn't done point by point, and it isn't done system by system. We have a methodology where you'll create these things using templates. And so what you do is create asset-based templates or system-based or process-based templates. These then, then can be replicated. And then when you add something to that template, like a new mathematic or a new calculation, that can not only be back calculated, it can then be said, okay, I want to apply that new mathematic to every piece of equipment that I use that template on. And they all will immediately inherit the mathematic. This enables a quick rollout of value. I mean, you can roll this stuff out quicker than we ever used to be able to do in the past. And then, of course, this gives you a kind of total view of the organization. This capability, I believe it's time to get information greedy. I believe you don't need a digital copy. You need an enhanced digital copy. You need to be not only to take that OT data, but augment it with future data, weather forecasting, uh, bringing in your schedule and measure your deviations bringing in corporate financial data, cost of consumables, being able to have real-time like PPA contract or regulatory compliance KPIs, uh, being able to measure your best 
performance, your startups, those types of things. And then, of course, being able to use that in other systems as well. An example of this is TransCanada. They're using these templates from a perspective of having not only equipment-based, but also health index calculations, which is really doing a real-time calculation of the health of the equipment, and then also be doing some templates that are based on anomaly detection. They take that and they can roll this out across all the similar equipment that they have very quickly, very easily, and also can make change, change, changes to it. But this actually provides them a complete drill down view of their whole entire pipeline or corporation. They can go from a dashboard looking at it from a high end, seeing what's alerting, drilling down to the site, drilling down to each piece of equipment. An example of a dashboard that is addressing these types of things is this. This is a, a demo copy from a, a combined cycle gas turbine. We wanted to show some of these extra type of data that you would want to add. So on the right of the dotted line here is actual future data. Future data is used by many corporations to put in their forecast and update it reg reg regularly as those forecasts improve. Here what we have an example of the 15 minute day ahead schedule for this particular plant. And at the dotted line is real time. So they're being able to measure their actual scheduled versus their, their production. Now, if this happens to be a market where they will find you if you're overproducing or, or underproducing, you can now capture those with event frames and easily extract how many times you were over or under and how long that, that, that exceedance was. You can also bring in some market data, some value data, and that might not be a true profit and loss in that number, but it gives the plan an idea or the site an idea how much money we're making right now. This could also be based off of a PPA contract. So you can bring in your, your, your pricing, calculate how much revenue that you think you're making at that time, how much fuel you're bringing in, how much it's costing you. You can also do things around safety events. Uh, Europe and Australia and others are really focused on process safety, where they actually are identifying all the things within a site that could be a safety-related issue and legally in having to be able to track those things in detail. And by doing, uh, by being able to capture all that information live in the system and putting event notifications on them, you will be able to have an easy reporting system as well to extract that information. I'd like to show you a little example of a couple of these uh, tactical views of how to do this. This is Advista Valkamp. It's a hydro company from Norway. And this is a condensed version. This is just a couple slides, but I encourage you to go to OSISoft.com if you want to see these presentations in full and watch the presenters present them. What, what they did, they were a very small company from an IT or OT uh, de department size, and what they really have is how can we observe these observations and understand, well, are these really too high? It kind of depends. Uh, is the sensor data correctly? These might be okay, these aren't, but we really want some kind of response from machine learning that tells us where we should be. What they did was a very simple architecture for a tactical level one machine learning. They collected data from the sensors and the SCADA systems from the plant, and it's going into the data archive. Asset Framework is, is organizing that information in a way that is then abstracted into machine learning tools via VBA and making Python calls. Python calls are returning a machine learning results, and that's being fed back into the system so it can be trended and monitored just like if it was real-time information. This is a very nice, low-cost architecture that's providing super high value. I'm going to cut to one of the one of their major re re results, and it was around a stator cooler, a piece of equipment that actually cools the generator. And they're looking at the information, looking at the expected temperatures coming back from the algorithms. But really, they have this slide here, right? This one trend, and this trend here shows that if this line, uh, if their equipment is running around this number one level, then it's good. And, you know, it's running very very well. It's cooling. But if it gets up to level two, it's only cooling at about 50% of its capability. And if it gets up to level three, it's only doing about 33% cooling. So as you see here in this trend, the, they started losing some performance on this cooler. They did some cleaning. It drops right down to normal to where the machine learning says here's where it should be running. And then it starts to drift up again as it gets dirty. And then they, they do a thorough cleaning and flushing, and then it drops back down. So all the data and information around this stator cooler 
uh, is kind of boiled down to one really good trend that they can do notifications off of as well to understand the overall performance of this piece of equipment. Now, Avista now has, has kind of confirmed this methodology approach, this tactical view of going after pieces of equipment and that architecture. Now they're going after many other pieces of equipment within the hydro facilities. Another example that's quite impressive is from Energy Queensland in Australia. Uh, they really needed to do capacity monitoring. One of their issues is they are huge. They are, their grid is about seven times the size of the whole United Kingdom. They have 27,000 kilometers of underground uh, cables and 192,000 kilometers of overhead. They are sparsely populated though. So these circuits go through miles and miles of no customers. And the problem that they were having is how do I know what my capacity is in these conductors? Because instrumenting all that would be quite expensive. But they do have some information that they know. What they know is what is the asset? You know, what, what size of cable? How far does it go? They know these things. So these are physical attributes that they can put into the system. And they also know the limits and ratings of these things. What they also wanted to know is what's the solar radiance on those wires. And so they found a way that we will calculate solar radiance within Pi Asset Framework and be able to have that based on weather stations that are near the, the assets themselves. And then they want to know the ambient temperature, wind speed, and wind direction. How the wind blows across these circuits is critical, whether it's blowing across them horizontally or down them vertically. And so what they can do is then get that information, get that weather, they find the locational, uh, the closest weather station, and they bring in the numbers from it. So they have a measured ambient temperature, a measured wind bearing, and they can uh, also look at the wind speed as well. Now by doing this, I'm gonna cut through just one of their final slides here, but this, this trend here is they instrumented a couple of their big segments, and then they ran, then they tested using analytics to calculate what they thought it was on others. And they calculated what it was on these. And then they compared exactly how their calculations look compared to the actual measurements. And they were really close. They got so close that they're confident now of saying, we will just do analytics based on the data that I showed you just a second ago to determine what we think the capacity ratings and availability of that network is uh, without even having the instrumentation. So their issue was they have a changing electrical distribution landscape. This is because they have a lot of distributed solar in, 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 uh, in Australia and other DERs type coming up on the grid. So they really need to understand their grid better. Uh, there's a downward pressure on them reducing cost. They need to improve the utilization of these circuits. Uh, the project itself had demonstrated potential of being able to use these assets by over 20%. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some more customers that actually do uh, incredible va value from these types of approaches. First would be AGL, that's Australia Gas and Light down in uh, Melbourne. Uh, they actually have been using the Pi system with a center that's using tactical machine learning via an advanced pattern recognition product on top of the Pi system. Just in the last three years, they've had over $18.7 million in avoided losses. They also have a one catch that they avoided, which is between 50 and $70 million on a large generator. Uh, just shows you the value of instrumentation when people are looking at things, when systems are looking at things, uh, of the kind of money return that you can get from doing these type of OT approaches. Tanaga National uh, out of Malaysia uh, had over 10 million in, in savings directly tangible to the plants themselves. They also, in their talk, talk about how they think they saved around $7 million in avoiding doing multiple point products by using the infrastructure and doing it more in-house than by going outside. So it's very impressive. And one, one more I'll highlight is Iberdrola Renewables. This is their core center out of Spain. They have over 6,000 wind turbines and 285 farms. And their issue they had was when they were told to back off generation, when they're told to uh, curtail, um, they're very hard to manage 6,000 generators with a certain curtailment point. 
what they did was they started to block, look at the totals within asset framework. They took a class to learn how to do it. Uh, then they came back and changed their strategy. They had an increase of 30% and, and sometimes peak of 60% improvement. Now that's just making money that was being left on the table because they weren't able to adhere to the set point as closely as they should. A very impressive use case. My contact information is here. Uh, you can also contact us through Tom as well. Would like to acknowledge that we have a PI 101 live demonstration uh, that's going to happen on Thursday, August 1st. Uh, please join, 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 join in and see an actual demonstration of the products. I'd like to thank you very much for your time today, and I believe now we're going to open this up for some questions. Thank you, David. At this time, we'll be taking questions from our audience. Once again, please use the Q&A option to the right of your WebEx interface and we will answer your questions as they arrive. If you have happened to change your view to full screen, the Q&A option may now be located at the bottom. So we'll wait for some questions to arrive. All right, our first question, how much time is ideal from starting to deployment of a digital transformation shift in a team? David, Remy, what have you seen as like the ballpark time frame for initiatives? You know what, Tom, I, I will answer that uh, briefly. I think um, when you consider a digital transformation, you have to look at it as an ongoing project. Uh, it's a moving target. So by nature almost, um, telling, okay, there's a start date and end date, um, I'd say it's not the right mindset. Um, that's not just you're wrong. You have to go uh, iteratively and project by project, initiative by initiative. But you know, think about it as something that will never end is probably the right answer. Um, Thank you, Remy. David, any assessments on like ballpark time frames for just getting started? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. In fact, you know, it, it, it really determines the adoption of the company itself to that concept, right? Are you really going to embrace and do digital transformation and understand the value that it really brings of getting information into people's hands that they can use on a regular basis and easily access. Uh, the companies that I see that adopt that philosophy and push it out quickly can do complete corporations within you know, two to three years. Uh, I've seen uh, in the AGL's case, they went to an enterprise agreement you know, less than four years later, they were getting those types of results. And this was monitoring multiple different ICEPs, uh, assets, coal plants, wind farms, solar. They're putting in battery systems and such. So it wasn't just a particular type of project, but the strategic adoption of when we get an asset or when we have an asset, here's our approach. Here's the information we want from it. Here's the kind of KPIs we want from it. And it's kind of a going in position. It becomes a strategy of a company to be digitally based, to make decisions off of data, to know that they're data driven. Okay. When I see companies adopt that, it happens very, very quick. It's, sometimes you'll see it happen in pockets because it will be a certain director or a certain person over a certain asset that will adopt it. But when I see adoption across the entire corporation with support from the higher level, including the C-levels, uh, you will see it happen rapidly. Well, thank you very much. Our next question is for Remy. In, in slide four, I think you mentioned IT tech discipline. How do you see IT versus OT tech selection and management comparing? Um, it's, it's actually a good question. Um, I think um, it, it, into a technology, um, historically, you know, IT has been there to um, manage and support, you know, reporting, uh, process optimization. They were very much good into that. And, and I think that right now, and that's still, that, that's still where most of them are, um, in a way. Um, and I think now the challenge is to, is to really move into something that will be much more uh, short-term based and much more innovation based. So it's not anymore, hey, you got three, four years to integrate some kind of ERP, but you got three months to actually support a new digital initiative that, by the way, might be related to OT and get that running. So it's basically, they, they are in a position right now where they, they have a tendency to, to 
Spain a little bit in, with back office type technologies to you know um, business process uh, ERP those kind of things uh, where OT um, and I won't go into too many details, but my observations right now is I, I cannot even exactly define what OT is and what the technology they use because every day I hear about a new tech, a new capability that they have, a new knowledge, new skills, um, and that makes them very nimble. Also, when you talk about OT, there's so many different types of OT depending on the sector, depending on the application, depending on the company, depending even on the geography. It's, it's a little odd to say, but I would say that right now the ones that are um, embraced, or at least at first, are usually the one, um, if you remember my slide on you know, the uh, transformational, strategic, or tactical things, it's more on the tactical level, so it's usually anything geared toward um, maintenance, predictive maintenance, uh, getting more visibility over asset, asset management uh, is pretty big. Um, but, it, and it's usually a little bit more geared to want. Um, it's not just about having a dashboard, it's actually to create something tangible for the business. I don't know if that answered the question very well, but that was a very broad question, but very good question. Thanks, Remy. We actually have another question for you regarding the horizons you mentioned earlier in your presentation. Um, this uh, attendee is asking, what's the forecast on when Horizons 1, 2, and 3 will begin? So, um, Horizons 1, 2, and 3, um, so 1, we're already there, okay? So, it, it should be, if you uh, look at it from a sort of project perspective, um, you should be executing now. So, you're not at pilot level anymore. Uh, you're actually starting to scale it. You have something that works. You have selected the right vendors, and it's basically rolling. Um, Horizon 2, uh, it's anywhere from you're just planning and, say, um, preparing it. So you're looking at technologies and vendors and solutions that exist to actually um, um, take care of those use cases up to some sort of uh, small pilot. It's testing. It's how does it work? Let's do that here on the side and see if that does anything specific. So it's any time from now up until a year or two. Horizon three can be um, much further away. I'd say usually something like two to five years away. Um, it depends on the use case. Uh, it depends also sometimes on the company culture. Um, some um, David was mentioning that you know some embrace uh, the idea of like becoming digital faster than other. So it's, it's not a precise measure when I say three to five years, but it's usually horizon three to, three to five years, horizon two anytime from now to two years, and horizon one, we're already in there. Excellent. Our next question, what recommendations do you have in regards to bridging the gap between strategic and transformational data initiatives? Um, so I was trying to briefly answer that question by introducing the um, software-defined automation model. Um, the, the point here is not necessarily to say, okay, you got to use that model, this is the best in the world, and just do that. It's just the idea is to say, okay, you, you have to start to think about um, technology not for their functionalities, but in terms of value. So you, you look at an asset, connected asset, and you have to start looking at it from the, the perception of the value of the data that this asset is creating, manipulating, transferring, using, name it, um, more than the actual value, like tangible um, physical value of the asset itself. Um, and, it, and it's really like switching from um, bundling together, from looking at the physical and the virtual world as two different things, as looking at it as one. So it's the um, transformational uh, aspect of it also includes, you know, it's process, um, workflow, assets, software, hardware, people, partners, clients, they all become part of that same business ecosystem. So it doesn't matter if you are someone or so something, uh, what matters is how do you position versus one another, how you support one another, and um, how you actually thrive at continuously creating more value and figuring, figuring out more um, nimble association of functionalities to create new ones. So it's really also about 
moving from let's do something all better and moving on to let's do something new. So it's, uh, I call that combinatorial innovation. Uh, you know, no one is expected to, um, you know, reinvent the wheel necessarily, but like by but by pulling together a couple of capabilities and functionalities, you can create a new one. That's it's a question of mindset, I would say. David, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I think it's the whole to to, to build a bit on what Remy said. It, it's it's the understanding from the IT side and the organization itself of that the value of the information that's coming out of the OT is coming, that is the profit center data and not the cost center information. And to be able to focus on that in new ways and be able to make sure that you're an enabler of that innovation as opposed to some kind of roadblock to that innovation, I think is key. It also broadens where it's used by when that kind of recognition of the value takes place you know, back in my previous company, we even would have written into our EPC contracts when building a new facility or building a new asset that, you know, they couldn't even test that information until it was collecting data and information that we could analyze and store. Uh, this, this idea of using it even before we had operational use of those assets saved millions of dollars in litigation when things went wrong. It was basically our security cameras, our data security cameras, into the building of you know, multi-million dollar facilities, um, which when things go wrong, people immediately start wanting to have litigation around that. And if you bring data, you can stop litigation very quickly. So it's an overall mindset of where that information helps the company and, and an adoption of that by the IT organization. Excellent, thank you. You know what, I'll, I'll, I will just add to that, um, to put some face onto it. Um, you just said something very important. Uh, you know, the, 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 in the mindset switching, uh, when do you move from being a cost center to a value generation center? Um, it, it's, it's, it's probably also one of the pillar of like moving from strategic to transformational. Thank you. David, our next question is for you. Many plants have thousands of pieces of equipment. How would you prioritize for your customers which equipment to address first? Well, I have a simple term for that. Normally, it's chase the money, but but actually, you should address most of the equipment that's considered critical to operation or critical to reliability and availability. Uh, many companies have already identified what those are, and they'll do that within their uh, work management systems and such. They'll have what they say a Type A class of equipment. But if you look at around reliability-centered maintenance, those types of concepts uh, or, or programs. Uh, you will identify the key assets first. I would also look at the ones that are causing you the most pain. Uh, but to say that means that you really are, are expecting some type of slow rollout to be able to finally encompass most of the things at the plant, and you actually can go after a lot of it quickly, especially if you broaden that brush to where it's not a single point being able to create those innovation areas, to be able to include the environmental group to create what they need for their world, to include like the water chemist, to be able to do things around water chemistry and such, the reliability centered engineers and such, to be able to focus on key equipment and, and the things around condition-based maintenance. Uh, it kind of comes clear uh, what assets you should be focusing on, uh, especially in the large complex plants, because you can track uh, really where the money's going and where it's hurting the company the most. Thanks, Dave. Folks, we're running out of time. Uh, we know there's been a, a hundred few more questions that we have um, in the queue, and if we're not able to get to them today, we will certainly follow up with a personal response after the webinar. Um, I'm just going to take one more question here. Some companies have their IT and OT have different cultures. Under these circumstances, how do you manage the IT OT integration to maximize ROI? Um, good question. Yes, sure. There are standards that work differently. There are different mindsets, and and on. Uh, we talked about that. I think it, it starts by. Um, trying to create um, a combined or unified leadership that is not uh, geared towards, you know, is it IT or OT, but what is digital and to what um, was said right before, um, where is the money? And from there, actually build the organization and not 
focus too much on the technology itself or where it sits or should be sitting, um, it doesn't matter. By the way, um, in the size of slides, um, I, you know, I sometimes couldn't make the difference between is it IT, is it OT, um, and does it matter? Um, I don't think it does matter, and I think this is this is part of the, the whole thing. Um, it, it's really about, uh, yeah, moving beyond um, what was IT OT. I, as a matter of fact, um, I try myself to not use the term IT OT convergence too much, but just using the term means that you are recognizing that those silos and those differences and those technologies are still existing. And you want to go beyond that. You want to actually move to transformation. Um, that's the point of it. Thanks. So Dave, I know we're running over, but do you have any thoughts as well? Yeah, I, I think it gets back to some of the comments that, that, that we made earlier. One is that it's an educational thing from the ITO side. You, you really don't want to look at things from a, whether it's IT or OT, except from the security and, 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 and risk associated with it. Other than that, you really want to look at it as company information that needs to be accessed, utilized, and leveraged to increase the bottom line of the companies. Uh, uh, and, and once that approach is taken, I've seen companies make it from either they enhance the OT group to have more IT skills, or they enhance the IT group to know more about OT. Uh, you actually see some organizations that envelope all of it around a technology group. Um, and so there's multiple ways that it gets occurred. It, it depends on the culture of the organization. Uh, but in any of those scenarios, you can find that point of success if you're focused on that, on that, on that bottom outcome. Thank you, David. Folks, we appreciate your patience and staying with us past the hour. We have a, quite a few more questions and we're sorry we're not able to get to them, but we will definitely follow up with each one of you personally with, um, with, an, with a response. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And if you do happen to have additional questions following our session, please do feel free to reach out to us from one of our follow-up emails after the event. Once again, thank you for attending our webinar today, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And David, Remy, thanks again for presenting. Thank, thank you. you, Tom. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.